are you? It's so beautiful out today, right? Oh my gosh. Um, it took us 13 hours to get here yesterday <laughs> from Newark. We missed our connecting flight and then we wound up driving from DC to get here. So I'm grateful to be here. I got about seven hours of sleep, which these days I try to get like nine or 10. So I'm a little, I'm a little over caffeinated and underslept. <laughs> Um, so my talk today is what I'm calling the spirituality of sex, beauty, and aging. Sounds a little juicy and fun. Um, and I wanted to, before I got into it, just make sure we kind of ground ourselves in this moment. It'll be useful for me too. So let's just make sure we're comfy. Maybe close your eyes and just like three deep breaths and just kind of connect with yourself here in this moment. So we can be open to receive the conversation today, right? Okay, one more deep breath. Always so much better after that, right? Okay. Now everyone can, can come to. Um, so I was having a conversation with a friend earlier in the week um, who's done several Wanderlust lectures, and she said, well, what are you talking about? And I said, the spirituality of sex, beauty, and aging. She's a very evolved woman, and she was like, what the hell does that mean, you know? <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that's exactly the point. I kind of want to... Um, you know, get people to think about it, if you will. So to me, you know, what I'm talking about, I, talk, I chose those topics, sex, beauty, and aging. I, obviously, I think they're pretty catchy, but more from this perspective of they are how we express ourselves to the world, right? We use all three of them in ways to, to manifest ourselves in the world, um, to communicate with others, and you know, really they're, they're a core expression of, of who we are if we let ourselves authentically express, right, into the world. So, and when I'm talking about sex, it's not just the act of sex, you know, although that's a huge part of it. It's, it's also, you know, our ability to, to flirt, right? Our ability to feel like vitality. What kind of partners are we choosing? How are we in bed? Are we open? Are we closed? Are we present? Are we detached? Um, you know, what, is, what does sex mean to us and how do we let it define us? And then when it comes to beauty, of course it's not just our external, you know, um, though we often get caught up in that, right? It's, it's um, I love Khalil Gibran says that Beauty is not in the face. Beauty is a light in the heart. And that's the kind of beauty I'm talking about. You know, that inner beauty that radiates out. And then not just of ourselves, but the beauty with which we see the world. You know, what, what type of eyes are we seeing the world through? And are we looking for beauty or are we looking for, you know, the opposite, like fault or blame or, you know, people's... Uh, negative characteristics, if you will. And in respect to aging, you know, it's a tough conversation, I think, and I think aging just gets a really bad rap. You know, everybody just looks at it as a very negative thing. We're going to decay, we're going to decline, we're going to be useless at some point. Our bodies will give up on us, you know. And... Um, and I'd love to challenge that conversation because I think it's very much a perspective. And it's, you know, my thing is like, are you letting your age define you or are you defining your age? You know, personally, I feel better at 40 than I did at 30, that's for sure, you know, and probably better than I was at 20, you know. But, but that's me, you know, and I choose to try to live my life in this, in this spiritual way that I'm connected to... Um, the true essence of who I am. And that, that took work, of course, and it will always take work, and, and I, I embrace it. But so when I'm talking about the spirituality of sex, beauty, and aging, 
it's, you know, how do we define spirituality? So I think most of us see it as a belief system, right? You know, maybe a religious belief system or, you know, do you believe in a higher power, the universe, whatever you want to call it, you know, that there's this spiritual aspect to our lives. So it's a function of being spiritual. But I wanted us to look at it today as more of a function of just our spirit. So not, not someone else's belief systems that maybe we're adopting, but, but our own belief systems and connected to our own sense of spirit. And so the, the definition of spirit in the dictionary is, I believe it's something like, the non-physical aspect of a person, you know, their, their emotional state. And I am a practitioner of Chinese medicine, right? I've been an acupuncturist and an herbalist for over a decade, and acupuncture and Chinese herbs are just really one part of Chinese medicine, and there's this whole beautiful philosophical system that, that comes along with Chinese medicine. And the spirit to us is one of the most important aspects of, of health and wellness. And we see the spirit as, it's like one's vitality, one's presence in life, um, and really one's state of consciousness, you know, kind of just are you right here, right now with me in this moment? You know, your spirit is awake, your spirit is aware. And I'll look for spirit in people, like in their eyes, you can see it um, shine through, you know, if there's a real light in their eyes, if you will, or, or is there a dullness, you know? Um, and, you know, when I'm in the clinic, I, I look for spirit in many different ways. And, and in Chinese medicine, you know, I could say, too, in my own clinical experience, if I get a new client that comes in and they're connected to their spirit, like I can see the light of their, their heart in their face, if you will, or in their eyes, or they're very emotionally connected to who they are, I know that the healing process is going to be quite easy to be honest, you know, because for me, it's like, okay, well, that's in check. So all we got to do is just work out some of the kinks. And if I get someone who's fairly disconnected, meaning they're, they're very blocked off, they're not, they're not in touch with who they are, their authentic self, um, it's going to be a longer process for me. So over the years, I've come to this conclusion that to me, the spirit is the expression of our authentic self into the world, right? Um, and to steal something from Danielle Laporte, she says, the sacred distillation of who we are. I love that. I cheated yesterday and I was watching one of her Wanderlust talks. And I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. She wasn't talking about the spirit necessarily, but she was talking about like who we are. And, and I love that. And that's the idea of this, like our sacred distillation. You know, who are we authentically? And so a little background on the spirit from a Chinese medicine perspective, we say it's, it's housed in the heart. So every organ in Chinese medicine has this function from a physical perspective and from an emotional perspective. And the emotions actually play a much greater role in health and wellness to us than any other thing. And so we say the heart is considered the emperor in Chinese medicine, so it kind of rules it all. And when he's functioning properly, it doesn't matter if it's a he or she, I call it a he, um, it's a kind, benevolent leader, you know. And so the spirit lives in the heart, we say. It houses, um, the heart houses the spirit. When everything's functioning properly, our spirit can kind of come and go as it pleases and interact with the world and express itself, you know, and in this sex way or beauty or aging or however way you want to see it. And we tend to live very nice and joyful and easy lives, and we, we see more love and gratitude than we see anything else. We age typically more slowly. You know, there's a lot of science that shows that happy people age better than unhappy people. Chinese medicine, that makes perfect sense to us. Um, we see beauty more, right? And I think we actually radiate that inner beauty a lot more when, when the heart is open and the spirit can kind of do its little dance. And, you know, when it comes to sex, too, I think we're very in touch with who we are. So 
we can choose the right partner and we can be present in those intimate moments and we can really express ourselves to the world and be confident, right, and feel good about it. And, and people are attracted to us and, you know, we're attracted to, to similar people. So there's this sense that when the heart is really open that these aspects of our lives and our spirit really flourish. And then there's this closing of the heart, which we all do. And it's normal, you know. Um, but what we say in Chinese medicine is if the heart's too closed and it becomes too rigid, the spirit becomes homeless. It literally doesn't have a place to go to anymore. It can't come in and out. It literally just kind of separates. It disconnects from the heart. It, it disconnects from its home. And for us, what that manifests in our life as is like, we're unclear on what we want. We are kind of directionless. We, we lose touch with who is our authentic self. Um, and we lose touch with that, you know, that heart center, right? There's so many people that talk about like, live here, not up here, you know? And so what happens is when there's that disconnect, we, we are up here. And we're typically letting things like fear or trauma or blame rule our life. And then there's this total separation, you know? And so we have to find ways to work to soften the heart again and to warm it up and to make it hospitable for the spirit, to make it want to come back home, if you will. And so then we can ground into, into our heart. Um, you know, for me, a personal story, because no one's perfect, um, it was like five years ago, my dad was diagnosed with a very aggressive late-stage cancer and, you know, rocked my world. We were very close and he was very young and I get emotional just talking about it, but I completely vacated my heart. I was like, F this, I can't be here. This is too painful, you know, and I went all in my head and doing what I do for a living. My mission was to save his life, you know, and it was just everything that I became that. And, um, and I disconnected from every aspect of my life, I would say, you know, and including my relationship with him, because I just, I got so scared, you know, and I let, I just really let fear rule my life. And I saw it in the partner I chose at that time in my life, you know, it was like the worst decision I'd ever made when it came to a partnership. And, um, and I knew it, like, I remember my mom saying to me one day, like, are you in love with this guy? And I was like, oh, God, no, you know. Yeah, now it's just nice to have someone, you know, I was so detached, I just didn't even give a shit, sorry for my language, but I didn't, and um, business-wise, it affected me, beauty for sure, you know, I couldn't see any beauty in myself, and I, I really didn't see it in the world, you know, I, I used to say well, there's life before cancer, and there's life after cancer, you know, and that's kind of how I went about it, and um, I had a lot of anger, I would say, and... I started aging really kind of fast. I started seeing more gray hair and, you know, just, I just didn't, I didn't, I wasn't being true to my authentic self. And I think if I would have tuned into my authentic self, she would have said, you know, your life's going to be okay no matter what. You're going to be able to go on no matter what. But my inauthentic, unclear self was saying, there's no way. You can't live without this man. You can't do it, you know. Your whole family's gonna fall apart, like just, you know, you should just jump ship. Um, and, you know, the worst case scenario happened and he died and I didn't, and that was a beautiful learning experience for me. And I think I, you know, through my own teachers and my own work, I realized that in those moments I was letting fear rule my life and not love, you know, I was, I had vacated my heart. Like I said, I had walled it off. It was just no entry zone at all, you know, and my poor spirit, she was just like, what do we do now? Who are we? And, and then I worked and, you know, and I got, I got the connection back again. And it's, it's okay to get it back. It's okay to lose it. It's okay to get it back. I think we have to lose it to kind of know what it means to get it back, right? You know, um, and I think it's okay, too, if we're walking around and we're not always connected and we can live in our head a little bit of the time, but if we can really get back to this true sense of how do we authentically express ourselves in the world, like 
what is the spirit you're bringing to your world? And are you 100% on board with it? Or is some of it influenced by other people or you know, the reality of your situation? Are you, you know, choosing fear over love? Really, it's that basic. You know, in my, in my clinical practice, I deal with a lot of women's health and fertility. Those are the main things I usually help women get pregnant. That's my, my main goal. Um, and obviously, I practice what I preach, but <laughs> um, I see a lot of trauma in that arena. You know, a lot of women trying to conceive and not succeeding at it or, or miscarriages. Um, it's just a sucky, sucky time for women who are trying to conceive. But often, I'd say nine and a half times out of ten, there's a disconnect between the heart and the spirit. And so they've completely lost touch with, like, their authentic self, which their authentic self knows. You know, and I say it in my book. It's like the first question I always ask a woman is, do you believe that you're going to get pregnant? Because in your heart, if you believe that, then I don't think we have that much work to do. But if you don't know what you believe, then we got some work to do. You know, we got we to gotta open up this heart again. And some women are so afraid to go in there. They're scared, shitless, you know, and I don't blame them. I mean, my experience was different, but it was the same thing. I was so scared to go in there to know what the truth was because it was like, ah, I can't do it. But, you know, to, to get people reconnected again to that, that spirit of who they are and then to know what they're, you know, their true north is, right, or their true self. It's uh, vitally important to health. I had this, um, I always tell this story, it's a fun story. I had this one girl, and she was, she was young in the world of fertility. You know, usually I see women in their late 30s, 40s. Um, and she was like late 20s, I think, early 30s. And she had gone off the pill and got pregnant right away. It was like the first time they were trying, and boom, it happened, it was awesome. She miscarried. It shattered her, as it often does. It's just, it's crushing for a lot of women, um, for all women, I think. It's not a fun experience. But um, so then she spent the next year trying to conceive naturally with her husband, unsuccessfully. So by the time I met her, they were kind of a year into this trying to conceive process. She had already been to fertility clinics, and she was convinced that she needed to do IVF to get pregnant. That was it. I wasn't going to stop her. She was basically coming to me because her mother-in-law made her. Her mother-in-law is a client of mine. She didn't even really want to be there, you know. And, and interestingly enough, she was a psychologist. But, um, you know, my first intake with her, I, we, you know, I kind of got into the talk about sex. And I said, um, you know, how connected are you to sex these days? And she was like, I hate it. I hate sex. You know, I used to love having sex with my husband, and I just... You know, it's just no fun, and it's always, we're always, you know, and this is, I hear this all the time, we're just trying to achieve an end result. We're not having sex to meet each other, you know, to share that intimacy. And, and then she went on about how she can only have sex in one position because she read that on the Internet. If you were any other position, you wouldn't get pregnant, you know. She can't have an orgasm because, like, that could screw up implantation, you know. All these not true stories were in her head. Again, very disconnected from her heart. And um, so anyway, as, as luck would have it, her insurance wouldn't cover, they had to wait a month to do IVF. And so she said to me, she came in like her next visit and she said, all right, I'll do, just get, you got one month, tell me what to do, I'll do whatever the hell you want me to do. Like, you know, herbs, food, whatever. You know, and I gave her my little protocol and, and she, she adopted it. And she was in really good health though, to be honest, you know, so I didn't have much work to do in that regard. It was the emotional stuff I had to do. And I was like, okay, this is your homework. I want you to go buy something sexy. I want you to like feel good in it. I want you to go home and have like hot sex with your husband. And I want you to have like hot sex like, like several times a week. It's not just around ovulation. Like we're not trying this month. I just want you to like reconnect with him. And, um, and I want you to orgasm, and I want you to have sex in every position. I want you to let go of this idea that sex has to be, you know, I mean, for her, it was like missionary, and she'd lay with her legs up, you know, five minutes after, like the stuff you read on the internet. That isn't true. Um, <laughs> if you want a girl, you lay your, I don't even know what it is, but um, so sure enough, I mean, and again, I wish all these, all my stories could be this, this simple and easy, but so she was like, that's it? That's all you want me to do? And I was like, yes, that's it. That's your homework. And you come in every week, and I, you know, and I will continue to work from 
an energetic perspective to open her up, right, energetically, heart-wise, so that her spirit can find its way home. And she did it, and she actually, you know, her husband was happy, she was happy, like he felt wanted and desired as like a person again, not just a sperm donor, you know, which is what happens. She actually felt like sexy in her body again, which was beautiful and connected to herself. And of course, um, she got pregnant that month, you know, and she didn't need to do IVF, and it was beautiful. And she was kind of mad at me, you know, in a weird way. Like, she was like, what the F? How did this, how was it this easy? This whole time, all I needed was one of these doctors to tell me I have to enjoy sex again. And, um, and I was like, yeah, you know. And, and you know, that was, it was a great story. And it's in, it's in my book because I think it's one of the best stories ever. But, um, and we still laugh about it. And now she just had her second kid and, you know. Doesn't, doesn't have any problems, which is wonderful, you know. She's like, here I thought I was infertile, you know. Um, and that, by the way, is a terrible word. We shouldn't use that word infertility ever. It's a very disconnected word, by the way. Doesn't mean you're, it's either on or off. You're never broken, you know. You're either just lacking a little bit in fertility or you got a lot of it. Um, but so anyway, to kind of wrap this up so we can open up to a conversation. I think, I think the best ways to reconnect with the, the spirit that is within us is to, A, tune into that heart center, right? You know, um, does it feel open or closed? I think we're all evolved in some level, right? And we kind of know, are we, are we open or are we closed? Are we allowing? Are we receiving? Or are we not letting anybody in? And look at the things in your life that make you feel closed up. And I would say drop them fast, you know, or choose to perceive them differently. You know, choose to see love and not fear. Choose to not blame other people for where you are or who you are. Take responsibility. You know, you are responsible for how you feel, nobody else. So own that a little bit more. And of course, as we all know in this world, practice gratitude all the time, as much as possible. Even in our 13-hour trip here yesterday, it was like, isn't it pretty, you know? <laughs> oh, didn't we get a nice rental car that we weren't expecting? Um, you know, just try to appreciate it or just even own it. You know, be okay with where you are too. You know, it was like one, at one point we had a little bit of a fight and it was like, listen, I'm not happy either right now. This sucks. You know, it's like own it and be okay with it and then let it go. You know, like don't let it take over your life. You know, and, and most importantly, I think we just want to get to that place where we're seeing more love than we're seeing fear. You know, and that's, that's really it. And as one of my teachers always says to me, she's like, even if it's just 55% of the time, it doesn't have to be, don't put all this pressure on yourself that it has to be like 100% of the time I got to be happy. That's exhausting. I heard Deepak talk recently, Deepak Chopra, and he had said, he was like, if someone tells you you need to be happy all the time, I would drop them from your life. You know, <laughs> he's like, it's not possible. But just to, you know, A, be kind to yourself in that process and just know that like, you know, 55% of the time of being happy is a lot better than just 30% of the time and, you know, slowly work towards that, so. The talk today I'm going to give is on decoding the mystery of relationships and I have uh, some real intentions and specific things I want to cover in the talk. Um, and and the, perhaps the first one is just to even start with a question, is are, are relationships mysterious? Is there a mystery in relationships?